Our evening joyfully continues now with the, the first lecture of our symposium, and it's my great honor to introduce Father Columba Stewart, who was a Benedictine monk and priest of St. John's Abbey in Collegeville, Minnesota. He is the executive director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, known as Himmel, probably because of its German meaning of that word. And his principal scholarly contributions have been in the field of monastic studies, Benedictine studies, and Eastern Christian monasticism. He holds degrees from Harvard College in Cambridge, from Yale University, and also his own further theological studies at St. John's University School of Theology in Collegeville. And then he earned his DPhil at the University of Oxford, where he also taught theology and he wrote his thesis on Greek and Syriac asceticism. He's been a priest since 1990, and he now masterfully leads the work of the preservation of manuscripts, collection and preservation of rare and otherwise uh, in danger manuscripts at Himmel. And we're very, very honored to have Father Columba with us this evening. Thank you very much, Father Ambrose, for that introduction and to the community for their hospitality and for all of you for being here this evening. It's a particular delight to see the rebirth of a monastic library for all the reasons that I'll share with you this evening, particularly one uh, where the librarian is an alum of our college and whose first work with Rare Books was at Himmel as an intern when he was a freshman. So congratulations, Tom. You've, you've come a long way. I'm always happy to be the first speaker at a symposium workshop because then it's done and you sit back and relax. However, I stand between you and your dinner. So as a result, I'm going to try to do this expeditiously and think of it as a kind of appetizer for what we'll be looking at in uh, the next day as we go through this. So my job is to talk to you about monastic libraries, their origins, their challenges, and their future. I'm going to do this under four principal themes. I want to talk about monks and books, books and libraries, monastic libraries in times of change, and monastic libraries present and future. And so when we get to present and future, I will say a little bit about the manuscript work that we're involved in at Himmel. So let's start first with monastic books, monks and books. So the purpose, obviously, of monastic libraries is to nourish the search for God, as well as cultivate the intellectual life. And I think that second part of it is important, as I will make the case in the course of the evening tonight. But the origins of monastic libraries were humble. Uh, monks were humble and poor. Books were humble in the earliest years of the monastic movement in Egypt in the fourth century. They tended to look like this. Uh, these are the famous Nag Hammadi codices. Uh, maybe, maybe not from a monastic library. A lot of them are like kind of little weird Gnostic stuff. I'm not showing it to you because of that. I'm showing it to you because this is what books look like. So they are in these sort of leather wallets. Uh, they were not elaborately illuminated manuscripts. They were simple conveyors of texts. And principally, of course, in a monastic context of biblical texts. This is one of the Bodmer papyri. This is a collection found not far from the Nag Hammadi codices in Egypt, probably books from a Pacomian tradition monastery. And Pacomius was the founder of communal monasticism in Egypt. And these were uh, probably hidden in the course of the seventh century which was a time of great change in Egypt with the rise of Islam and so on. And that monastic movement had kind of collapsed for various reasons, internal and external. So they stashed these things in Egypt. And if you want to take care of books long term, put them in Egypt or in Silverado Canyon. <laughs> because the climate's perfect. <laughs> 
And so that's why we have extraordinary things like the uh, Bodmer Papyrus Number no. 2, which is thought to be perhaps the oldest extant copy of the Gospel of John. And it's written on papyrus, as you can see clearly in this close-up, the beginning of John's Gospel, you know, in R.K., in Hologos, et cetera. And you see the, uh, the fibers of the papyrus. It's, it's remarkable that we have a manuscript this old. And to put it in context, we have very, very few scraps of manuscripts in Latin that are this old, simply because they were in Europe. And things didn't last in that kind of climate. So when you look at this collection of books uh, that are now called the Bodmer Papyri, and some of them are also in Dublin at the Chester Beatty Library, you find, as you would expect, a number of biblical texts, both Old Testament and New Testament, in both Greek and in Coptic. Coptic, their spoken language, the Christian version of the traditional Egyptian language written in hieroglyphics. Uh, Christians wrote in a modified version of the Greek alphabet. You also find texts which didn't finally make the cut into the biblical canon, but were very popular in early Christianity for their kind of amplification of the gospel story, like the Proto-Evangelium of James, which gives us the backstory to the life of the Virgin Mary. Uh, early Christian literature, the Shepherd of Hermas, Melito of Sardis. So in other words, the beginnings of uh, a post-biblical Christian literature. Biblical commentary, the great Egyptian commentator Didymus commenting on the Psalms. So uh, what do monks and canons do all the time? We pray the Psalms. Well, sometimes we want a little help in understanding what the Psalm is and how we apply it to our own lives as Christians. And then perhaps more surprisingly, classical literature, Homer, Thucydides, Isocrates, Menander, Greek grammar, writing exercises. Why? Because their language was Coptic, but the scriptures in so many of these crucial texts were in Greek. So one of the tasks of the monk in this monastery was to learn the Greek language. And to do that, you needed grammars and associated texts. So this then leads us to the question of, all right then, how do you form a monastic library? And given that sort of inventory from that random sort of stash of manuscripts in Egypt, how do we think about the purposeful creation of a monastic library? So what books does a monastery need? And what actually is a library, a biblioteca, uh, in a monastic context? So here we can invoke St. Benedict, whose name is occasionally heard in places like this and <laughs> fre frequently invoked in my, my own monastery. St. Benedict was insistent, like Pacomius, that the monks learn how to read. And this is an era when very few people were literate. Uh, literacy was a privilege of the elite. And this idea that you know, peasants and shepherds and uh, farm boys and so on would come to a monastery and be taught to read was a pretty revolutionary thing at the time. And St. Benedict wanted his monks, he's writing around 540, to spend a couple of hours a day re uh, reading and ideally do it before the heat of the day and the work of the day. And on Sundays, even more reading, and in Lent, even more reading. Uh, and you may think, well, that's a lot of reading. But remember how ancient people read. They read slowly, and they read out loud. And this wasn't because they were dumb, all right? It's that they thought, like the ancients did, that the written word was worthy of reading and delivery in real time at the pace of speech. And so reading was a slow, meditative exercise, which was closely connected to the memorization of the biblical text, so that monks in ancient times could rattle off the Psalms, the New Testament, by heart, because they had memorized it. So with that kind of background, what does he tell us should be in the library? This is the famous chapter 73 of the Rule of Benedict, the final one. And this is where he says, well, I've given you some basic rules for community, but if you really want to know more, than what we have in this little rule for beginners, this is the stuff you should read. And so I've listed it. This is, a, by the way, a very important early manuscript of the Rule of Benedict from the Monastery of San Gall. It's thought to be a copy of a copy, maybe of a copy, of the original copy of the Rule of Benedict. So it's the purest version of the text. So this is the one we use for all modern 
editions of the rule. And you can see it in uh, St. Gallen in Switzerland, should you find your way there. So this is the bibliography that St. Benedict gives us in chapter 73 of the rule. So there's the Bible, obviously. Then there are the teachings of the Holy Fathers. So this would be biblical commentaries and homilies. By the time he's writing the rule, you have St. Jerome, you have St. Augustine, and others who have commented on scripture. And the monks would use this in the liturgy. So they would read some of these commentaries in the course of the vigil office and so on. He refers to the conferences and institutes and lives of the fathers, which would be the institutes and conferences of John Cashin, who's somebody that I've written on. Uh, Latin versions of early monastic literature, such as the life of Antony, the rules of Pacomius, the history of the monks of Egypt, and then Latin monastic literature, so not translated from Greek like these other things, actually composed in Latin, uh, especially by St. Jerome, who wanted to insist that he knew who the first monk was and that Antony the Great was not, in fact, the first monk, so he wrote his own life of the person he said was the first monk. He was like that. <laughs> and then the only name mentioned by St. Benedict in the rule is that of St. Basil. So he refers to the rule of Basil, which he knew in a Latin translation by uh, the great scholar and translator Rufinus of Aquileia. So this is at least the core of what a library would have been in Benedict's time, remembering these were manuscripts. They were expensive to produce, copying was time consuming. These were not wealthy monasteries at the outset. But over the years, for various reasons, monks really got into books. And so the famous uh, stereotype of monastic scriptoria, because if you wanted to have the book, you had to copy it from somebody. So you went to another monastery and they had it and you, you borrowed it. More likely they said, you can copy it right here. You're not taking it anywhere. And by the time we come to the Carolingian era, which is really the beginning of what we think of as classic medieval Benedictine monasticism, thanks to the fact you had a, an empire in Western Europe, the Frankish Empire of Charlemagne and his successors. And they decided they wanted to tidy up religious life. And so they went around to all the houses and they said, you can be monks or you can be canons. And if you're gonna be monks, you're gonna follow the rule of St. Benedict, whatever other rule you were following previously. And so there was an agent for this process in the early ninth century whose name was St. Benedict of Anian, and we call him the second Benedict because he's really the reason that I can be from a monastery in Minnesota because had it not been for Charlemagne who loved the rule, Louis the Pious, his successor, who embraced the reform of monastic life and the work of Benedict of Anian, I wouldn't be here. And so what would they have in their library in this time of sort of high Carolingian culture in the ninth, 10th centuries. Everything, of course, that was in the Library of St. Benedict, as well as collected every known monastic rule, including many which were written after the rule of St. Benedict or were unknown to him because they had not been translated into Latin or they're from another part of the Latin world. And so they'd simply never come across his desk. Uh, by this time, you have later fathers, such as Gregory the Great, Isidore, Cassiodorus, staples of monastic libraries throughout the Middle Ages. You also had collections of homilies and hagiographies, lives of saints, again, for reading in the liturgy and reading at table. And you had a lot of grammars and Latin literature. So it's just like Egypt with Coptic monks learning Greek, Charlemagne and his empire, they were mostly Germanic speakers. So they're like us, right, speaking English. And so Latin for them was an acquired language, unlike for St. Benedict, where they were close enough that whatever their spoken dialect was, Latin was a very familiar language to them. And so this is what led to the creation of the great monastic libraries of the Middle Ages. Uh, and also things like medicine and science and astronomy and mathematics. You needed all of these things to have a monastery that provided a place for you to live and also took care of the people around you. So whatever knowledge there was about healing and herbs and the stars and all this kind of thing, you had to have it in the community. And monastic libraries were a place where that could happen. Now these 
Monastic libraries were not necessarily vast. Here's an example of Benedict of Anian's own scholarship, the famous Codex Regularum, where he took a total of 38 monastic rules and put them into one book. It was a monumental achievement. And this particular copy was at the monastery in Trier, then it uh, went to Munich. There's a long backstory, which I'm not going to tell you here, but it's kind of interesting. But it ended up in the library in Munich, where most of the Benedictine manuscripts from Bavaria are now, after they took them from us in 1803. But we're, we're going to get to that. So th this particular manuscript is, is notable because it was apparently his own copy, uh, perhaps even written by him. And there's his monogram uh, that you can see. So this is, this is one of the cool things you find when you study manuscripts. So this is how we get to what you think of as the great monastic libraries of Europe. This is Kremsminster in Austria. We'll touch on it again a little later in a different context. This library is so big because this photograph is taken of a Baroque library after the invention of printing. In the manuscript era, libraries were smaller. Uh, the great library of the island of Reichenau and then St. Gallen nearby, 400 volumes, and that was one of the largest at the time. Cluny, the great Benedictine monastery, uh, at its zenith, 570 manuscripts. So these were not enormous by our standards. You saw far more books in the library here than they had, but they were nonetheless remarkable collections of wisdom. So now it's time to talk about monastic libraries in times of change, and change came in different forms. One of them is technology, in other words, printing. There's scholarship and the leadership of Benedictines and scholarship, and then what we'll just call external events, which are a variety of things that created difficulties for monastic and religious life generally. So let's begin with printing. You may think that uh, monks were offended by the invention of printing because, you know, we're scribes, right? That was our thing, manuscripts, writing these things, and they come along, they're going to mass produce books by printing them. Uh, we obviously are against that. No, monks loved printing because, look at this guy, he's worn out from working at the copy desk. And then they come along and they say, we can make you 500 of these. And you say, deal. So Benedictines went early into printing, not so much printing themselves, but partnering with uh, printers, early printers, who were almost entirely German, uh, the first printing press in Italy was at Subiaco, the birthplace of St. Benedict, and that was the famous printer Swineim and Ponarts, who eventually ended up in Rome and they went bankrupt after they left Subiaco. I don't know if there's a connection. But we also have an example here of a very early printed book, uh, the second major printed book, printed on Gutenberg's press by his successors, a Benedictine Psalter for the monks of Mainz. So Gutenberg printed in Mainz. Gutenberg was a jeweler, as you probably all know, and he was able to create molds to make many, many copies of metal type. And then he figured out what kind of ink you have to have for metal to transfer uh, an image to uh, paper or vellum. That was his genius. But like so many pioneers, he went bankrupt. <laughs> and then his apprentice married the son of his banker and took over the equipment, and they printed the Benedictine Psalter <laughs> on that equipment. So, so this was awesome, that you could take these texts, which were so central to the monastic life, and make them so widely available. Then there's scholarship, and here's a, a shout out to one of the great Benedictine congregations um, of the sort of Benedictine reform following the Reformation. Uh, Cluny and the medieval French monasteries had really declined. Uh, they'd become wealthy and kind of flabby and not a lot of action there. The new orders were, uh, were the thing at that point. But some Benedictines got their act together in Germany and France. And the French Benedictines who got organized were associated with the congregation of Saint Mar. And these were just regular monasteries with regular monks who did all kinds of things. But they did sponsor important scholarship by notable members at their monastery of Saint-Germain-des-Prés in Paris. So you know the church. It had the tomb of this man, Jean Mabillon, until the revolution destroyed it, but there's still a plaque, so you can see that. And so this man, Jean Mabillon, is the inventor, 
as a Benedictine, uh, working in the 17th and early 18th centuries, of the modern science of textual criticism. And he lived at a time when they realized that manuscripts were disappearing. Uh, they were scattered over monasteries and churches throughout Europe. People weren't using them anymore. They liked the printed books. They're clean, they're tidy, they're organized, they have an index, you know, all this kind of thing. And manuscripts are messy. So Jean Mabillon and his confrere uh, went around Europe collecting manuscripts and working with them to create the modern study of ancient texts, and then to publish magnificent editions. He did this in the face of opposition from other monastic groups, like the famous Jean-Armand de Rancet of the so-called Trappist reform of the Cistercians. De Rancet was a manual labor guy, like just manual labor. And Mabillon was a scholar, and he said manual labor is great, but it's okay for monks you know, sometimes to do scholarship. And he and uh, de Rancet exchanged letters uh, and this was the basis for Mabillon's famous uh, treatise on monastic studies. This is the first Latin translation of it. He wrote in French to de Rancet. I guess, you know, he didn't want to presume that his Latin was good enough. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a book, by the way, from our own rare book collection. And in his defense of monastic scholarship, he had these little gems. He said that monastic societies were not founded to be academies of sciences, but they were founded to be places of virtue. And that only the sciences that can lead to religious perfection are to be cultivated in them. So that's his premise. That's his initial shot against Durante, a little defensive. But his understanding of what leads to religious perfection was quite broad. He also said that the libraries of monasteries are indicators of the studies that are done there. So this looks good here, but you got to read the books now, OK? <laughs> but it looks like what a decent library should be. And finally, he said, among the causes of the ruin of the monastic state, one could count lack of studies and lack of love of letters. So that's his diagnosis, so look out. He pioneered, as I said, the scientific study of manuscripts through his magnificent two-volume treatise, De Re Diplomatica. And what this was, was uh, an effort to engage with the historical problem of how do you put a date on a manuscript and try to tell where it's from, when it was written, and if it's a fake. And this started with monastic charters, which were little pieces of vellum, which were deeds to land or privileges given by royal or papal authority and so on. And there was a big business in forgeries because these would give you title, right? So. So the question is, how do you tell if something's authentic or not? And Mabillon and his brothers went through thousands of these documents and manuscript books, working with ones that were clearly dated and localized to create a kind of taxonomy of scripts. And this is the science we now call paleography, where if you look at a Latin manuscript, you know what you're doing, you can pretty much say when it was written and quite often where it was written simply by the style of the writing. And here's one of the plates in the book, which is giving samples of script. And given the fact that manuscripts were falling out of favor and in danger, they went on great journeys uh, across Europe. This is the description of one of their tours of, of Italy, which was a particularly remarkable journey that netted 2,200 manuscripts and books for the Royal Library in Paris. Uh, so the monks in the Royal Library worked pretty closely together which is ironic because all the monks' books ended up in that same library when it became the library of the nation in the French Revolution. Never mind. So they wrote up their journeys, and on the basis of the manuscripts they collected, they produced magnificent critical editions of ancient texts. This is Gregory Nazianzen, the great Cappadocian theologian. Uh, they did Latin texts, Greek texts, beautifully laid out, large format, um, folio edition. This is also in our library with the footnotes that show critical scholarship. Well, it says, you know, in this other manuscript, this is what the line says. Uh, we're going to put this one in our printed edition because we think it's better. And then you have long explanations of why you should prefer one over the other. So this is modern scientific study of ancient texts. And all those books in Sir Henry Chadwick's library, which are editions of the Church Fathers, they're on the basis of this. 
And many of them, in fact, were more or less the same as these magnificent editions produced by the Morrists. So now we have to talk about other elements of times of change, which we might call, uh, as I said, external events. So here's the Monastery of Monte Cassino, Mother House of the Benedictine Order, as it is today. This is a monastery with a lot of history. So uh, many of you know that in 1944, it was completely destroyed uh, because there were thought to be German soldiers hiding there. And then it was completely rebuilt, largely with American money, because I think we did most of the destruction. Uh, finished in the 1960s. But it's a monastery that had been through many things before, uh, abandoned for over 100 years in its early history, the monks expelled in the course of the 13th century, had fallen on hard times with um, you know, sad stories of the, the state of the library. Uh, one visitor in the, uh, this is actually Giovanni Boccaccio, the famous writer and poet, visiting in the 14th century after they'd had a particularly rough patch. And he asked to see the library. So he goes up to see the library and he is shocked to see that there is grass growing on the sort of window sills and many of the manuscripts are damaged and mutilated. And it turns out this is one of those low ebbs in the life of a monastic community, which had not yet been reformed and whose library was in the very course of disappearance. So this, this story of outside events is one that picks up pace with time. This is the library of Monte Cassino, uh, miraculously saved during the war. It's still there, it's really beautiful, but like so many monastic libraries in Europe, it is no longer actually owned by the monastery. So this is where we note the events of the Reformation, you know, the British Isles, obviously, um, German parts of Europe, German-speaking parts of Europe, which went with the reform, manuscripts gathered into state libraries, a process which was accelerated um, in the late uh, 18th century because of the Enlightenment and then the French Revolution and then the Napoleonic era, the result of which was that by uh, about 1803, there were almost no functioning monastic libraries in Europe at least in Western Europe, and even Austria was touched, although they got theirs back a little, uh, a little later. So as a result, the story of monastic libraries in the modern era is one of rebuilding and refounding, uh, occasionally reclaiming, but generally speaking, what they had before these events, the Reformation, the French Revolution, and so on, were lost forever. Now, I will confess, they're probably better off in state libraries from the standpoint of preservation and care and curatorship. But it took the heart out of monasteries when these libraries were taken. And of course, many of the monasteries no longer exist either because they were completely suppressed. So what we need to look at then when we talk about the present state of monastic libraries is this incredible transfer of the wisdom of monasteries and people like the Norvertines and other orders in our same kind of tradition, more or less, from the old world to the new. Then the new impact of technology, and then the present imperative to respond to crises. So this is the monastery of Metten in Bavaria, and this is where my monastery came from. They uh, were closed in 1803 as a part of these closures of monasteries in Germany because it was thought we no longer had utility. They were refounded in the 1830s because times changed and now there was a benevolent monarchy which liked monks and other religious orders, but the books were gone. This was also a time when there was a great missionary spirit in European monasteries because people were emigrating to the United States and they needed pastoral support they needed people to teach them in their own language. So as a result, the Monastery of Metten sent monks to Pennsylvania in 1847 and then to the wilderness of Minnesota in 1856. And that's where we came from. And so this, that's the Monastery in Bavaria, the Monastery in Minnesota. German monks like trees. And they also like, ideally, water. Because if you have flowing water, you can have a mill. And if you have a mill, you can cut the trees and make uh, planks to build buildings, and you can have a mill for grain and so on. So this is uh, our present campus in the summer. And 
This is the winter. It's friends, it is seven degrees in Collegeville, Minnesota, as I stand before you. And as a as a Texan who's lived in Minnesota for 41 years, I'm still not used to it. So when they came to what really was the frontier in 1856, the frontier from the standpoint, of course, of um, European settlers, not from the native peoples, progressively pushed west and north to make way for these people who thought they were claiming open territory. They brought a chest of books for the liturgy, right? So you have missiles, you have you know, antifinales, you have these kinds of things, not a big library. And so we have early library catalogs from the 1870s and 1880s, which list in that magnificent copper plate handwriting that they used back then. And in fact, every novice had to make his own copy of the Rule of Benedict and the Constitutions of the Congregation. And we have many of these from our founding monks written in this kind of beautiful hand. They all wrote like that. It's extraordinary. And now they just teach people how to print. Anyway. So this library is organized according to what you would expect. So Biblia Sacra, Theologia, Litur Liturgia, all these sorts of things. And we can see what they had. But what really made it more like a European monastic library was the gift of books by European abbeys which had clawed back a little bit of their collection or had bought back some of it or had started over. The monastery of Otto Beuren in Bavaria sent a large shipment of books in 1877. Metten sent more in the 1880s. And the true gems of our rare book collection are the cast-offs from these European monasteries. You say, we have two copies of this. You know, send it to Minnesota. We don't even know if they can read over there, but <laughs> we're, we're going to send it to them. But among them were some, um, some classic works, some of these editions of the fathers, and our monastery early on began a tradition of sending monks to Europe to study. And abbots would go to Rome for congress, congresses of abbots, and they'd bring back books. So things like that Morist edition I showed you earlier, unexpected uh, 1590 Arabic gospels printed in Rome for the missions, brought back by one of our monks who was the rector of the Greek college in Rome. They ended up in Collegeville. And so we, we have a... a pretty fine collection. Tom, is, Tom and I were down there uh, in the rare book room not long ago, in fact, looking at things. But it took that infusion from the old world, just as they had sent the first monks, just as they had sent artisans, they sent the books as well. So the old world to the new. And then we enter the sort of modern era in technology. And here I'm going to say a little bit about the work of Himmel, Himmel Museum and Manuscript Library. Beginning with our founder, Father Oliver Kapsner, who was one of these classic uh, Minnesota farm kids who grew up speaking German until they came to our prep school when they learned how to speak English. And they had farm families with 12 kids, and they got one farm. All right, two of you are going to the Benedictines. Two of you are going to the Franciscans. Two of you are going to the diocese because you can't divide a farm 12 ways. So he's an example of one of these people who got sent to St. John's and got an education and proved to be an extremely intelligent man who became a librarian. And he was a real librarian. And you see him depicted here with the quill. It's, it's a rather stylized portrait, actually by one of his great nephews, whose wife I just saw the other day by coincidence. But Father Oliver was not only a librarian who liked to categorize books. He actually established Library of Congress classification guidelines for Catholic books, which weren't really in the mindset of the framers of the Library of Congress system, which assigned the letters BS to the Bible. <laughs> so j just saying, so Father Oliver did his best to, to recover that for Catholic books. But his, his real genius, uh, working in the 1960s, which is when our library was founded in 1965, was to look at what was happening back to external events. All right, so some of us in the room are old enough to remember those years. Cold War, right? Austria is the only country in Europe where monasteries had really kept their books. And Austria at that time was a neutral country. Between NATO and the West, NATO much in the news again because of Ukraine, and the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union and its satellites in the East. 
And Father Oliver was very worried that these libraries in Austrian monasteries, which had kept their manuscripts through all those vicissitudes, could be vaporized in a World War III, which would be a nuclear war. And we really thought that could happen. I mean, this, this seemed like a live possibility at the time. So Father Oliver knocked on doors of Austrian monasteries and said, can we microfilm your manuscripts? And he got 12 no's, and then he finally got a yes at Crimsmunster, the library I showed you a little while ago. And so there he is with the fantastic mobile microfilming studio and that great VW van that <laughs> back in the 60s, they were all heading to California with a surfboard out the back. This is, this is what I think of, but they used it to haul around the great Kodak Recordak microfilm camera. And they microfilmed their way across Austria, Germany, Spain, Portugal, work in the British Isles. And even in the 1970s, which is sort of a turn to uh, the work that I do now, a pioneering project in Ethiopia with Ethiopian Christian manuscripts written in their ancient language of Ge'ez, because the Ethiopian church preserved certain texts that fell out of favor in the Greek and Latin churches. And so they were microfilming at the time of the revolution, which deposed the Emperor Haile Selassie, murdered the patriarch of the church, uh, the prolonged civil war, which we just saw a kind of repeat of in the war between uh, Tigray and the rest of Ethiopia recently, and they microfilmed manuscripts. So there's one microfilmed in 1979, which today is in a private collection in Scandinavia. It did not leave Ethiopia legally. And if you look at the line for provenance, I know you can't see it. Uh, I'll tell you afterwards where it is. The provenance is the name of a book dealer. So this is an example of what's happening with manuscripts in places like Ethiopia, the Middle East, uh, West Africa, where they are being traded as illegal antiquities, which are portable, easily exported, and you can buy it for somebody for 20 bucks because that's a fortune to them. And then a manuscript as fine as this one, you could sell for $25,000 in the West. So it's against this backdrop that we turn again to technology. So I know it's an iPhone 4 case. It's a little bit dated, but it's the only one I could find <laughs> with, with Jean Mavillon's picture on it. So we had Father Oliver with microfilm. And just by the way, Father Oliver hated computers. He was a card catalog guy. Microfilm is fine. Oh, after he passed away, we named our first electronic catalog at the Manuscript Library Oliver. So. <laughs> because he really did lay the foundation. So we turned to the, the digital era. And so we're not microfilming anymore, we're doing digital photography. And we're doing it in places like Iraq and Syria and Turkey and uh, South Asia and Mali, West Africa. And I'm just gonna take you to one location where we did this work. And that is Northern Iraq, the so-called Nineveh Triangle, which is a region where uh, Christians, Yazidis, Mandeans, and until the 1960s, very ancient and important Jewish communities lived in peace with their manuscripts, their traditions, and so on. So this was an area which um, suffered greatly in the Iraq war from 2003 onwards. Starting in 2009, we began to work with a heroic and wonderful uh, Iraqi Dominican named Father Najib Mikael, now the Archbishop of Mosul, Iraq's second uh, most important city. He's Archbishop of a city that has no Christians now. But they're still in the villages, so he still has people. So we worked with him to photograph uh, fascinating local manuscripts, like this 18th century gospel, which uh, Matisse could have illustrated this gospel, right? I mean, it's extraordinary. It, it's sort of folky, but then it's not. It's very sophisticated. They suffered terribly in the summer of 2014 when uh, ISIS captured Mosul and all of northern Iraq. They blew up. Uh, ancient Assyrian sites like Nimrud with barrel bombs and dynamite. They videoed the whole thing and put it out on their social media channels. They dynamited Christian shrines like the ancient monastery of Mar Benam, a very important Iraqi Christian pilgrimage site, and then defaced it with graffiti. I was there with uh, CBS News 60 Minutes in May of 2017, right after it was liberated. I knew this monastery before. I have never seen desecration uh, in a way that hit me so viscerally as this. Uh, the good news was, although we had digitized the manuscripts, the monks were smarter than ISIS. They hid them 
right next to the front gate of the monastery behind a false wall. And here you see them uh, shortly after the liberation, jackhammering through the fake wall and bringing out the manuscripts. This is a rare, happy ending story in places like this. The Dominicans in Karakosh, they had been forced out of Mosul into one of the Christian villages, Karakosh. This was their priory. Uh, the building Father Najib built is prior. Uh, my room is the upper right, defaced again with ISIS graffiti, uh, burned out a shell of a building, and burned the Dominicans' own working library. They got their manuscripts out, but this was things like Bible commentaries and dictionaries and atlases, the sort of stuff that a religious house needs to operate for homily preparation, for teaching novices, and so on. That's what a burned library looks like. And I saw more than one of these. In the rubble, we found, miraculously, this is a totally unstaged photograph, one of the sheets from our digitizing project. So this is the sheet that is written out for every manuscript and photographed with the pages of the manuscript so you have a documentation in the digital file. And they had trashed the studio, stolen the equipment. They didn't care about this. And I walk in the door with Father Najib, his first visit back to this building. And this is what we found. All right, so what do we do with this? And I, I'm near the end here. Uh, these microfilms, these digital photographs from all these locations come back to Minnesota. So this is our reading room at Himmel. We have the big university library right next door, uh, which has been recently renovated. It's a very, very nice space. And we take care of the digital data. We have catalogers who describe it. We put it online through our online reading room, which you see here. And there you'll find things like Syriac manuscript from Mosul, from a Syriac Orthodox library, which was largely lost. They found a few scraps of it uh, that people had managed to grab and hide, but most of their manuscripts, a very fine collection, destroyed. All we have left are the photos, better than ashes. And in our cataloging records for libraries like that, we indicate what we know of the manuscript. Is it still there? Was it stolen, resold, like the Ethiopian one? Is it presumed destroyed, or do we simply not know? This is one of the heartbreaking sides of what is otherwise enormously satisfying work. So, so what do we have that you can find in this modern manuscript library of microfilms and digital captures? 93,000 microfilms, all right? So think back on those medieval libraries. Think of the quantity of material you can now consult. More than 200,000 digitized manuscripts from uh, many different countries, languages, and cultures. We've got 92,500 of these with records online. About 50,000 are complete manuscripts. This is the largest online collection of manuscripts in the world. And virtually all of these manuscripts were previously unknown to scholarship because they were in places like Syria and Iraq and Lebanon, Southeast Turkey, and so on. And more than 14 million images available right now. So to give you an idea of how this will change our understanding of Eastern Christianity, just like the Maurists changed our understanding of the writings of the fathers and their editions, if you look at Western libraries, by which I mean the Vatican, the British Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin, Syriac manuscripts, so the Christians of Iraq and Syria, Ethiopic, Armenian, Christian Arabic, they have 9,000 manuscripts in all those great libraries. And we photographed almost 37,000 in their original lands to complement the ones that are already known. This is going to keep scholars busy for decades, if not centuries. And uh, this is, I have to say, I'm actually pretty proud of this. I think this is a pretty amazing accomplishment. And it's safe. Uh, Minnesota's pretty safe. It's actually pretty safe from climate change. <laughs> Global warming, bring it on. My last comment before we, we let you go to your supper, and maybe we'll have a minute for questions. I spoke earlier about the fact that our early monastic libraries had unexpected things like Greek literature and Latin profane literature and so on. And they also had very interesting things like uh, Islamic literature. And so here's a great example of the breadth of, a, of monastic learning in a library to understand better people you are either arguing with, fighting, or simply trying to understand so that you can, you can live together. This is a translation of the Quran into Latin. It's not a very good translation, but it was the first one into Latin. 
And it was made by an English cleric for Abbot Peter the Venerable, who was the greatest abbey of Cluny, that enormous French Benedictine congregation. He had monasteries in Spain that were part of his congregation. And this was the time when much of the Iberian Peninsula was occupied by you know, Islamic armies and rulers who had come from North Africa. And he said, well, we got to find out what these people think if we're going to be able to argue with them or deal with them, whatever. So he commissioned this translation. It wasn't printed until 1543. And it was printed by a Swiss Protestant publisher with a preface by Martin Luther. Why? Because the Turks were at the gates of Vienna. And the same idea was, we got to find out who these people are so we understand what's going on here and why they've been successful and how we can respond from our own tradition. And I'm happy to say that we have this in our library as a sign of the fact that we have to learn about each other. And we are working presently with Islamic manuscripts in the Middle East, in Mali, West Africa, the desert city of Timbuktu, which is having a lot of problems right now. Because we remember that much of the philosophy that enabled the work of St. Thomas Aquinas and the other scholastic theologians in the Middle Ages came from Greek philosophy by way of Arabic. It was lost in the West, is preserved by Islam. So you find amazing and incredibly useful things in unexpected places. And our goal is to make sure that whatever we need, we're going to have. So imagine my delight when I was in the crypt of the church. And I saw the motto of Monte Cassino on the tombstone of uh, Abbot Ladislaus Parker. The motto is Suchisa Vereshit, which is our old world to the new story. It's the story of monasteries like Monte Cassino. It's the story of Christians in the Middle East and elsewhere. What it means literally in Latin is cut it back and it still grows. So you think you cut down the tree and the oak tree puts out a shoot. I'm told that the abbot, it was rose bushes, that uh, you, know, you have creative pruning and then you get more roses the next year. So no matter what they try to do to us, this is the story here. No matter what they try to do it with, to us, we're still around. And our learning must be broad because our roots are so deep. And it's gratifying to see a community like this, which preserves such a tradition in that magnificent library. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Father, for the really, really entertaining, encouraging, interesting, interesting presentation of this important work. We have time for just a few questions, I think, before we all go eat dinner. And I know Frater Moses has one in the back. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Father. I was wondering, um, are there any efforts to digitize um, manuscripts at, in libraries throughout Europe and is there, is there an effort to make those more accessible? Um, and then what are the, um, are there any also efforts being made to sort of catalog those things? Because I'll often be, I, I mean, the only, the only um, experience I have of that really is Google Books, mm -hmm. um, but it's often very difficult to find particular things on there. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. It's a good that. question. The great news is um, the great libraries of Europe, like the Vatican Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale in France, British Library, they're digitizing their manuscripts. Or I should say they're digitizing our manuscripts um, that made their way into their collections. And they're putting them online. They're making them widely available. Um, so that's really good news. Is as much as it's wonderful to work in the British Library, which is something I like to do with Syriac manuscripts, it's really handy to have access to them online. And the Vatican was a little slow to get going, but they've really jumped into it. And so that's really wonderful. And in fact, there's more support for that kind of work in Europe now than there is in North America. Because the European Union puts a lot of money into cultural preservation. And these manuscripts are already cataloged because they've had them for a while and they have traditions of scholarship. But you're right that the challenge is how do you find it? I mean, if you don't know, it's in the British Library. And so getting to the point where we have what in the digital world we call uh, true open link data that's when all these databases can talk to each other. And so you can do a Google-like search on a particular text, and it'll tell you exactly where it is and have a link to it. We're not quite there yet. 
but we're all working on it. And so we're working very hard in our project, very standardized forms of names. We give names that are not in the Library of Congress files to them because we're cataloging a lot of texts and authors that are really unknown in the West. And all this will further that great day when we'll be able to find stuff in that easy way. We're lazy now. We like the Google box, right? We want to put it in there, and we want to find it. But we're not quite there with manuscripts. Father Columba, I hope this isn't too um, obscure of a question. What do we know about um, libraries and reading in, in monastic prisons in the medieval period? Do, do we know anything at all? There certainly were monasteries which had uh, places of meditation for recalcitrant monks. Um, I assume they were meant to do their spiritual reading, but uh, I don't really know the answer to that. So we do not have a prison in our monastery. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more, maybe point us somewhere where we could learn more about the manuscripts that are being illegally sold for bargain prices. You mentioned that a little earlier in your yeah, talk. Yeah, this, this is a really hot topic right now. The, the question of uh, trafficking in antiquities is a big deal because of places like Iraq and Syria where people are digging up stuff or they're uh, trashing a museum and taking it and selling it. And there are collectors in the West who will buy these things. They know it's dirty. But, you know, collectors are collectors. I mean, I like books. I, like, I collect certain things. It becomes a preoccupation. And manuscripts are recently getting a lot more attention than they did previously because the focus was on art objects. And, in fact, I just had a... a I've had two Zooms today, three Zooms today. It follows you everywhere these days, it seems. And one of them was with a cultural property lawyer who's actually been, actually has worked on a television series which is trying to dramatize trafficking in antiquities and they want to do some stuff on manuscripts. He's not inviting me to be on it. But this is a real concern at the highest levels of law enforcement in the United States, in Europe, because this is where the money is so this is where the stuff comes. And they're getting much better at intercepting it. Uh, we just had yesterday a, an email from the Smithsonian, a colleague there, with a PowerPoint uh, show of images of Ethiopian manuscripts they had confiscated. And they asked us, are these authentic? And I said, they look good. I'll ask our cataloger. He verified what they are. And they just were sent into the country, like, recently without uh, export licenses and permits and so on. So it's, it's a big deal. Uh, spe speaking of prisons, <laughs> are, are Norbertine statutes of 1630 specified that every linguistic geographic region, the abbeys in that region, had to have a common prison? And if a guy couldn't live the life, no dispensations, you go to the prison. And on that happy note, let's bow our heads. 